Okay, so uh, I'm gonna talk today about sort of the security challenges operating a public uh, public cloud service. Everything these days is 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 the cloud. Uh, that uh, It's almost become a piece of terminology that everything's assumed to be there. But by a public cloud, I mean something very specific, which is, where you have have a computation and storage service that you're making available sort of as a utility to you know sort of anybody that comes along and can present you with a credit card or or perhaps some bitcoins um, can can buy you know virtual machines that they're going to run up in the cloud and and um, do things um, if a if a company is running its own uh, service where it's running virtual machines in its own data center and only being used by its own departments, that's called a private cloud. And then there are cases of somewhere in between where people are taking, operating a service for carefully vetted customers that are, um, you know, they have a relationship with and, they, and that they trust. Um, and that's, you know, sort of somewhere in between. So, What's different when you're operating a public cloud versus when you're operating your own data center? One is that the stakes are a lot higher. Um, that if you have a, a major security incident of some, some sort, it may well put you out of business. Um, that the, the customers you know, have to trust you um, both with the reliability of your service and, and with the fact that um, you're going to protect them from other sorts of attackers. Um, on the other hand, even though the customers have to trust you, you can't really trust your customers because they might in fact th themselves be bad actors. Um, you haven't authenticated them very carefully and even to the extent that you know who they are, you don't know how competent they are and you don't know um, how honest they are. Um, so um, another, another thing that's really different is that you really want want to protect your customers' data from your own system administrators who might, have, who might have privileged access to your systems, but you nevertheless would like to make it uh, unlikely at least that they're going to be able to steal the customer's data and get it out, and so you have to build up controls. That's something that every customer wants to do in its own data centers is to keep you know, a dishonest operator from doing something bad. Um, but again, the, the what's good practice inside an, inside an enterprise might be a contractual commitment that you're making to your customers uh, as to how you operate. So um, what, what aspects of, of operating a public cloud are the same as operating a data center? Well, there's sort of the, the attacks that we all have to deal with. Um, you want to, you know, detect uh, attacks on your system um, and you want to, you know, prevent them. You want to mitigate any sort of DDoS attack that's coming in. Um, you have to protect the various services that you're running from each other. You have to keep all your patches up to date and you have to, um, you know, try to minimize the attack surface so that, that you only expose those interfaces you absolutely have to attack to expose um, because each one that you expose is another way that that if you have a bug some bad guy could get in so if you, if you take what a customer views a public cloud as looking like, um, they sort of see it as they're sitting off in the corner and in now instead of having to order and install machines, they just have to provision them um, through this, this interface. Um, and then they load up their application and they run it. And then the, the customer's customer or the, the end users really don't know that whether the difference between operating in a public cloud or operating on the, on the uh, uh, on some uh, data center run by the enterprise. From the provider's point of view, um, the provider sees this but um, also sees that there are multiple customers in there and that the customers, the goal is that the customers really aren't aware of what other customers are present. Um, they should be completely invisible to one another. Um, and the, the whole goal of the, the, the economic basis of the public cloud is that if you have lots and lots of customers, you're, the growth of resource requirements is gonna be more predictable. Um, that, that any individual company, you know, doesn't know whether it's gonna, you know, shrink by 100% next year or whether it's gonna grow by 200%. Um, whereas if you have enough customers and can average them out, you can, you can make a better prediction as to how much resources you want and you can get them into the pipeline and get them provisioned. 
the attacker's point of view on a public cloud is, oh my God, look at all these new attack surfaces. There are all these places I can attack, and I can attack the way I, I've always attacked things by going in over the websites, but I can also um, try to attack the provisioning service, and I can attack customer service at the, at the cloud and, and uh, lots of other places. So security basics, keeping the bad guys out. There are lots of things that you have to do when you're operating a data center. Um, you need to you know, authenticate your customers, you need to authenticate your administrators, you, know, you have to you know, get your programmers to use good coding practices and you have to configure things carefully and run anti-malware and you know, anything else you can do, all these standard things. Um, but the, the responsibility for these things is now to some degree divided between the cloud provider and the and the customer who's running things there. So um, this is when you're looking at attacks that are just coming in over the network that uh, the network network based defenses like firewalls um, are now things that become shared resources. The cloud provider is going to want to share those resources between d different customers. Um, and exactly, configuring firewalls can be very tricky. Only the customer is really going to understand what it is the application's doing, what needs to be let through and what not, can't be let through. Um, but only the cloud provider is really going to understand the configuration of the network and how things are connected together and, and where things are going to come apart. So these, these different sources of information have to be integrated in order to properly configure the tools that are going to be out there. Um, the um, typical data centers don't expose their servers to the full onslaught of the internet. Um, firewalls are nearly universal. Um, and there's also all kinds of intrusion detection, you know, hardware and software that watches the network. There are DDoS DOS um, uh, mitigation hardware out there, and people install things like SSL accelerators and things like that. Um, and getting, getting them configured correctly is a hard thing to do. Um, and one of the advantages that's happened out in the out in the real world is that different people buy things from different vendors, um, and and all the firewalls are a little different, which is actually a actually makes life harder for the attackers because if an attacker can figure out how to break through one firewall, there's some set of people that he's can, he can now attack, but uh, but there are a whole lot of others that he can't because he hasn't figured out the other ones. The, the economic advantage of the cloud is that, is that things are centralized. The cloud provider is likely to pick one set of, set of tools, and to the extent that an attacker can get through those tools, he can get at all the customers in the cloud. And so this becomes a, a um, you know, the, the, you have, you can spend more on tools, but, the, uh, but once you've done so, the, if an attacker can reverse engineer it and, and now you're exposed. So it's a, there are advantages on both sides. Um, diagnosing problems when you are under attack and you're trying to figure out what there are, you want to look at both the logs that are coming in from your applications and the logs that are coming in from the net network, but the different logs are owned by different parties who have to keep the information private, uh, you know, one customer's data can't be exposed to another customer, and so how you do that is a, is a very tricky problem to resolve. So. Um, in a public cloud, you typically can't bring up your, you know, get your own firewall hardware, the same thing you've been using for a while, and install it at the, uh, at the vendor's site, um, unless the, um, that the, the cloud provider is going to pick some sort of firewalls to use, uh, unless you can get the firewall vendors to actually port their software to run on virtual machines, in which case it'll run inside the cloud, and then customers will have that option. So one of the, the things that cloud providers need to do is encourage the various firewall vendors to, in fact, port to their platform so that it can be made available to their customers. Um, and the, you know, so the cloud vendors have to be able to, to be competitive and provide equivalent tools or get the, uh, the commercial ones to run in, in their sites. Um, you know, the customers can bring diagnostic hardwares to analyze what's going on on their networks. Um, the same thing is, you know, the cloud provider can do that, but the customer of the cl cloud provider really can't. 
Um, and then a big problem is that, um, as they say in the horror movie, the call is coming from inside the house, um, that the attacks on customer sites might well be coming from inside the same public cloud, that the bad guy might be able to, you know, can buy a virtual machine just like anyone else and can use that uh, there. So firewalls that only protect you from the internet are no longer sufficient because, the, because you have to be protect, protect one customer from another. Um, the advantage that the public cloud has, uh, though, is that cloud providers can afford to hire sort of the best security experts to be able to, um, to look at these problems when they come up. Um, a problem that's extremely rare for one customer is gonna be an you know, everyday occurrence for a cloud vendor because it's gonna be somebody's gonna be under attack. Um, they can, uh, they can detect port scans and things like that that are, that are crossing multiple customers' boundaries and they can correlate that data and, and identify who are the bad guys, you know, where are the, what are the IP addresses that, that are suspicious activity is coming from um, in a more general way than, a, than an individual customer could. Um, and it's sort of just as if you're gonna buy DDoS mitigation tools that you only need rarely, um, if you're a cloud vendor, again, you can buy them and in fact, some customer is gonna need them and you can, you can uh, rent them out on an hourly basis just like you're renting out virtual machines. So a new attack surface that, that you have to worry about is the provisioning system itself, that, that the bad guy can go out and try to impersonate customers in order to be able to get at their virtual machines. Uh, they can you know, allocate new virtual machines in the customer's environment and things like that. Um, the cloud provisioning system is a web application like any other subject to the same sort of attacks um, and it's replacing the data center controls that are often based on physical controls of actually having a guard standing at the door. Um, and so the, this, this particular application really has to be rock solid against all forms of attack including, um, including DDoS attacks. Um, and so, and, and it really should provide sort of the, you know, very strong forms of authentication because, because just as people might say, I'm only gonna allow updates from inside my data center, um, if you wanna provide a similar level, level of security to somebody who's remote, you, need, you really need to be providing, you know, support for smart cards and integration with other forms of authentication and being able to lock down accessibility only from certain IP addresses um, and, and use techniques like that. Um, that's not to say that the people deploying public clouds actually do that, but they really should. Um, um, and then, I, as I mentioned before, the uh, the bad guy might actually buy a buy a service, and and use that as the the platform with which he uses to attack other things. And so um, he has a lot of bandwidth um, uh, available to him, and and can try to break out of the the bad guy's sandbox. So a new security challenge that comes with the, uh, is in addition to keeping the bad guys out, is keeping the bad guys in. We're essentially creating a little enclave, uh, a, a computing environment that we wanna make sure the customer can run whatever he wants to in there, but that he can't get out of there and, uh, and mess with other parts of the cloud. And, in, in a nor normal data center, you have to worry about that, but you mainly have to worry about the various administrators being incompetent. In this case, they might actually be malicious in terms of trying to do things. Um, and you have to really defend against that as carefully as you would against uh, external attacks. Um, operating systems are designed to keep users apart, um, but uh, none of the operating systems that are popular today anyway really can offer this, the kind of airtight control that would reliably prevent a bad guy from influencing something else going on on the same platform. And, and the sad part is, is even if you could build an operating system that did have really good security, nobody would want it because it wouldn't be compatible with all the tools they've come to be used to. Um, so the, you know, that, that becomes a, a real problem. Um, 
Um, I was the security architect for Windows Azure from about six months before it went production uh, for the first few years of its operation. Um, and what, what Azure chose to do is also what AWS chose to do is to use uh, virtual machines as the sandbox. So we give someone a virtual machine as opposed to giving them a, a, uh, a, a container or a process inside a, a VM. Uh, could have used processes, could have used, uh, you know, the, the managed code isolation like you get with uh, uh, Java virtual machines um, to do it. Um, and we looked at all of those. And VMs uh, actually have the advantage of, be because they're a relatively new technology, um, it tends to be a lot more secure than the other ones, that there's sort of an inevitability that when you deploy a new technology, at first you design it um, carefully, um, but then over time, in order to get the performance to be better, you sort of cut holes in various places, and, and inevitably um, security problems come up with that. And my, I have a real fear that virtual machines, in fact, over time might become less secure than they are today, um, just as people try to get the, try to improve the performance of them. So when you, when you, um, Create, when you want to create the illusion that the customers are isolated from another, it's more than just access controls and keeping them from accessing each other's data. One of the real issues is, is resource quotas. Um, that, you know, how much bandwidth are you going to let the customer use um, when they're trying to do something? Um, and, you know, how much CPU capacity, if you're running on a machine that has a lot of virtual machines on it, how do you divide the capacity up? And one of the things that's a real tough call and a real economic issue is most people, you know, reserve more resources than they actually use. And so what do you do with the excess resources? The natural thing to do is to, you know, give them to other customers who want them, and that way you can deliver, you know, you can, uh, you can, you know, deliver more than you've promised, um, and. Um, and you know, improve experience for people. Unfortunately, as soon as you've delivered more resources than, than you actually have because some people aren't using theirs, now if people start using theirs, they'll see their performance go down, which means that the performance isn't reproducible. So the question is, do you want to give them the best service or do you want to, the best service you can or do you want to give them you know, absolutely predictable service that never varies? Different customers want different things um, and it's that's a, a real hard thing to decide um, how you want to do it. Um, Hyper-threading is a, is a real problem with respect to um, both, the, both with the performance predictability and with respect to security. Uh, if you're running on a same hyper-thread, if you're running on a, a separate hyper-thread on the same CPU core as somebody else, you might be able to get some insight as to what they're doing. And all these speculative execution attacks that have come, come up in the last uh, year or two um, have made life very exciting for, uh, for cloud vendors because now the because it breaks the virtual machine abstraction and lets people see things going on. So this is something that that people have to pay a lot of attention to and, and figure out how to do. I have an interesting story about the hyper-threading, which was that as a security guy, I said, you know, absolutely not. You can't let, you know, different customers who don't trust each other have separate hyper-threads on the same machine. There's just too many ways it might be exposed. And while the, the CPU vendors might be, you know, putting out patches as quickly as they can and you can write code that's carefully resistant, ultimately that's just too easy an attack surface, you can't make it available. And they said, well, you know, nice to hear your concern, but we don't really care. Um, and, you know, because we want to charge less and so we'll give one guy one thread and another guy another thread. Um, and then the performance people came back and said, oh, but when different people have different hyper threads, their performance becomes unpredictable. And they said, oh, well, that's terrible, so we won't let you. Uh, so they, th then, the, then they decided to do the right thing and they wouldn't divide uh, threads between, between customers. So the security ended up winning up out as a side effect. Um, social engineering the support people, you know, what happens when the customer really did forget his password and he calls up and he wants to be able to get back in, you know, how do they authenticate and how do you keep bad guys from exploiting the same paths for getting in there? Um, and this, you know, this becomes a matter of training because the bad guys are, are all, you know, carefully know how to play on the heartstrings of the emergency of the, of the situation to be able to get back in. 
protecting customers from the cloud administrators, there's always a way, there's always going to be a way that a sufficiently privileged user can get through the access controls. Um, you know, either recover from some, you know, disastrous situation or there has to be a way, way to update the controls and when you update the controls, they, they'll do different things. So the, you know, cloud developers and operators, you know, might be tempted to, you know, do some various forms of corporate espionage and, um, and the cloud provider has to make sure that, that that's difficult. And um, certainly one of the things you want to do is make sure that anything that they do is easily trackable so that they'll get caught if they tried, if not immediately, then, then you know, then as, uh, as their activities are audited. Um, but, but you have to set up, you know, strong controls that, that keep people out of these things. And furthermore, you need to have them be documented procedures because your customers are going to want to know what they are. And you're going to need auditors to show that you're actually following the procedures that you say you're following. Customers want to be protected from governments. It, it, it's interesting, it used to be France that was noted as being the country that committed all this corporate espionage on, on behalf of its businesses, of, of foreign businesses. Now it's the US that everybody's worried about. Um, and, but you know, it's, it's, there are always going to be governments that are going to abuse their power to be able to get at things. And how does a, a cloud provider provide, again, a comparable degree of protection for each customer than the customer could get if they were operating their own site. Some of the laws are written such that that if you pro pro post your data with a third party, it's it's not as well protected as if you keep it on your own site, um, because the assumption is that if you post it with a third party, you know you don't have the same reasonable expectation of privacy. Um, that that law works against uh, public cloud providers. Um, there are legal battles being fought over who has the right to get at which data. Cloud providers will, you know, comply with with valid subpoenas, um, and so you know, you know what. But cloud providers are also tend to be multinational organizations. Exactly which governments have the right to do what um, inside those provisions? Um, there are technologies that that should be able to protect things like Intel's XGX, which allows you to run things in an enclave that that the even the operator can't break through. Um, and one of the things that's not known is whether this is in fact going to be the answer to the cloud provider's problem or whether it's gonna be just a way to get them, get them locked up because you know, they have the data and they're ordered to provide it, but they technically can't and so what happens? Nobody's really found out yet and there's a legal precedence to happen. So those are all the things we thought about before we you know, deployed the system. Um, what actually happened um, when we opened it up? Well, the first attack we saw was there were bots that were creating attacks with stolen credit cards and exhausting our resources. Um, we thought we were doing really well. You know, the, the sales were going up faster than we, than we thought and, uh, and we posted you know, some really good uh, month's revenues and then all of a sudden the, uh, the credit cards started bouncing. Um, and uh, we thought about this issue and you know, thought you know, how to protect it, but the thought was that it wouldn't be a serious problem because there was no way for, for the bad guys to make money on it. Um, and unfortunately, this was just as Bitcoin mining was becoming a thing, but before the hardware had taken over so you could actually make money on it with, uh, um, with stolen VMs. Uh, a, a more interesting attack was that one person in our group was Vietnamese, and he followed Vietnamese websites, and he started seeing these ads that you could, could actually buy Windows Azure accounts in Vietnam. And he, he you know, we were, there were a large set of countries where we were doing business, but Vietnam wasn't one of them, and that seemed odd. Um, and it turned out what it was is people were, were breaking in and stealing accounts with stolen credit cards and then reselling them um, uh, to people that might, might or not, you know, might or might not suspect that these things were actually stolen accounts. Uh, credit cards, it turns out, don't work the way you might think. I don't know what, what, the, what the experience of people in this audience are, but I certainly wasn't aware that um, uh, because of the, the payment card industry regulations, you need an especially secure machine in order to be able to process credit card numbers, which um, most vendors don't actually do this themselves. They outsource it to some third party that runs a site. And so when you want to collect somebody's credit card number, it's usually invisible to the end user but they're actually redirected to this third-party site
site that collects their credit card information and just returns a you know a tag or receipt number to the 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 person that was uh, um, to the to the to the actual vendor, um, and which means that that the same stolen credit card might be used to create thousands of accounts and there's no way for you to know because the because the uh, outsourced credit card vendor is just turning it into a to a a, a number um, and you'll get a different number for each time the the credit card is used um, the uh, for card not present transactions which is essentially all the internet transactions um, if you go to a store and use a credit card and buy something, and it turns out the card and the and the store owner follows all the rules and checks back and says no, the card wasn't reported stolen or anything, um, and then it turns out there's fraud, the the vendor the vendor at the store is protected and it's the credit card company that ends up you know eating the loss. Um, but with card not present transaction over the internet, um, it's the vendor that ends up eating the loss. The banks won't cover that because the because the, so the vendor is responsible for things like, you know, which is why vendors want to make sure that they're delivering the product to the address that's associated with the credit card because that way they're more likely to be able to track you down. Um, but so the... Um, uh, so, so, uh, the, and the uh, so the vendor is responsible, and furthermore, they're responsible even if the the loss isn't recorded till months later. So, somebody steals a credit card, you know, they start getting charges to it. They might not notice immediately, and a couple months later, you eventually find out that there's a problem, um, and so you can cancel that account. But they they've registered lots of others that are going on in parallel that they'll just move to. So um, the other problem that we found was what do we do when our customers attack the internet? This was not really a big concern. We were worried about our customers attacking other customers, but it turns out that, that having a platform um, where you can go out and um, you know, send out uh, spamming data or uh, have DDoS bots or, you know, organize your, um, you know, set up phishing sites and stuff like that are all things that the bad guys want to do. Um, and these are essentially an attack on the internet. Um, and, you know, of course, you know, all the vendors, in, in this sense, I've often thought that um, a public cloud vendor should think of itself more of a, as an ISP and less as a, as a, providing computing services, it's really providing high bandwidth access to the internet from something that the, the bad guy controls. Um, and so the, you know, the ISP is not responsible for what the bad guy does, but they, but they do need to take some responsibility for, for managing the, the network and, and what kind of things can go on there. And so, you know, one thing is that you don't want to get bad press um, for being the host to these, these bad things, um, but, but it's actually worse than that because the um, uh, uh, cloud providers are a good platform because they provide, you know, more anonymity to the customers that, you know, Comcast, when you go out and get an account, they know where you live because they went up and hooked up, up the wires. Um, when somebody comes in over the internet with a credit card number, you, you know, they can then disappear and, and you have no idea who it was and it's hard to hold them accountable. So, it turns out that out on the internet, there are automated systems that will punish you for bad behavior. So IP addresses that are sor the source of spam and malware very fairly quickly get uh, detected and blocked. Um, so you might be able to get away with something for, you know, five or ten minutes, um, but in fact, very quickly, somebody will report it and through automated systems, uh, a lot of the systems on the world will stop listening to your, your traffic. Um, and, uh, but, but in the cloud, if you can go out and you can rent an IP address with a gigabit of bandwidth for 15 minutes, um, the, those automated systems are going to work and they're going to blacklist that IP address, um, but that's okay. You shut down that VM, you start up another one that's going to be at a new IP address and the, the retaliation is going to go against whoever that IP address gets assigned to next. Um, and so it's, it's not just a matter of being a, a good citizen, it's, a gonna ma it's gonna be a matter of nobody's gonna wanna work on your platform if all your IP addresses have been blacklisted. So 
Um, so you'd like to be able to detect bad behavior. Well, how do you distinguish, you know, a spam agent from a from a mail uh, from a mail relay that's distributing email to a distribution list? Um, they both look very much the same if you're just looking from the outside. Um, if somebody's doing lots and lots of DNS attempts to to look up names, you know, how many are they allowed to do before you decide that actually what they're doing is an exhaustive search of the namespace? Um, uh, attack as a service is actually a, uh, a useful thing. If somebody's trying to test the resilience of their system to DDoS attacks, you know, buying a cloud service to actually roll out a DDoS attack in order to see, you know, whether your um, whether your mitigation techniques are working is a reasonable thing to do. Um, so you clearly can't, you know, but that very much means that you can't distinguish that case from the case where the person's actually using it to do DDoS. So, you know, how do, how do you detect what's bad behavior and what's not, and how do you do it quickly because the bad guys are going to be extremely agile at, at moving these things around. Um, we thought when we set this up that, that all we'd have to do is handle complaints. Um, and in some sense that's true, um, but how do you handle complaints? Um, if bad traffic's coming from a resource, a logical thing to do is to, you know, forward the complaint to the person that owns the account. Um, sometimes when a bad thing's going on, it's because a good guy owns the account, but his VM was compromised, and now a bad guy is doing something bad from it, in which case it should be his responsibility to, you know, clean up the VM and get it, get it working properly. But the cloud provider can't distinguish that case from the case where it's actually a bad guy who's bought the VM and is doing this on purpose. How do you distinguish those, those two cases? Um, do you, you know, do you forward the customer's contact information to the person that's complaining and say, well, you should complain to that guy? That's giving away customer information that, that you might not, that the customer might not want disclosed. Um, it also might not help the guy who's complaining because he's gonna be complaining to a black hole um, of uh, who it is that's being attacked. And, and the other thing to worry about is that the guy who's complaining, there might, there might not actually be any bad behavior at all. Somebody might be complaining because because they're trying to make life difficult for the person that's providing a legitimate service. And so how do you distinguish those cases? And I suspect ISPs have more experience with dealing with, with these kind of problems than, um, than these traditional, than the public cloud vendors ever did. And this is one of the pieces of information that sort of needs to be shared around. Another very interesting one, it has to do with takedown notices, that if, you, if someone cl claims that you have uh, posted, you know, this copyrighted information that people are downloading, and the, the main thing has been with music and movies, um, the, the laws were, you know, written as a compromise, and they say basically, if you're a public service and somebody else has used your public service to do this, then, you know, you have so many hours from the time the complaint comes in to take it down or else you'll be held responsible. If you take it down within that number of hours, then you're not held responsible, the person who actually posted it is, to the extent that they can find them. Um, but um, but now, when you, now as a public cloud operator, when there's a legitimate customer, how do you know whether these takedown notice complaints are legitimate or not? Um, if you block something every time you get a complaint, um, then, then legitimate customers are going to get blocked. Um, if you try to notify the customer or wait for them to respond, uh, sometimes you're gonna be too late and you can be held responsible for their bad behavior. And so this, this is a, a real problem and the laws are extremely inflexible because they, and they didn't really anticipate this scenario. And so, you know, these are, these are sort of new, new problems that, that come up that are gonna take a while for the, uh, for the world and the industry to try to iron out. Um, so, parting thoughts, one of the things is that, that you won't be attacked until it really matters, that when we opened up, when we opened up the system, uh, we, exp we were expecting, you know, DDoS attacks to start coming in immediately. And they didn't, it actually took a few months. Uh, the, uh, the, the reality is that you have to have something that's worth stealing before anybody will try to rob you. Um, and so, um, 
uh, and it'll always come in when you least expect it. And you won't be attacked at the interface that you, you know, that you thought you were. The, the interface that you worked so hard on, uh, on defending, um, that's not going to be where the problem was. As I said, we were defending against all these attacks between VMs and, and attacks on our customers from the outside world, um, which did show up, but the first thing we saw was the, was, you know, DDoS attacks outgoing um, and of, of various sorts, and the sort of the uh, DDoS in general is going to be the last attack that people think about when they're designing their access mechanisms, but it's going to be the first attack you ever see because it's the easiest thing for a bad guy to do to you. Um, the fun part of, of doing security for systems is, is coming up with really clever ways to attack hard problems. That, you know, DDoS attacks I find sort of is the most fun area in security because it's, um, uh, there are so many challenges, so many things you can do to trick the bad guys, but they can work around you. Um, most engineering problems you're working against Murphy's Law um, with, but uh, in this area you're work actually, actually working against human adversaries and, and, and you know, you can be clever and they can be clever and it's a war of wits and I, I really enjoy that. Um, the hard part of all this is knowing when something's secure enough and it's, and it's time to ship it um, because um, it'd be tempting to wait, wait forever until the security is perfect, in which case somebody else will have captured the market before you get there. Uh, if you go out too soon, you'll have a security disaster, and if you go out too late, you'll go out of business. Um, and figuring out where the right trade-off is is always gonna be hard. So, any questions or, right, questions or am I, I done or what's the deal? Eh, si tienen alguna pregunta, algún comentario, eh, son bienvenidos. Tenemos tres micrófonos. Eh, reitero el, el anuncio de que cuando estén haciendo alguna pregunta se identifiquen y que eh, conversen muy pegado al micrófono para y de, de manera eh, lenta para facilitar el trabajo de nuestras traductoras. Adelante, Carlos. Thank you very much, Charlie, for your presentation. I my, my particular interest is in one of the topics that you mentioned about um, the influence of the perceived threats of state actors, mm -hmm. uh, where you know this evil government can actually subpoena you and get your your customers' data actually, and there's you know that is very hard to refuse. I. Gracias. <laughs> Uh, I remember a while ago reading some papers about uh, the concept of a tamper-evident cloud, where you actually, y you cannot refuse the subpoena, but you can actually make it explicit that you're complaining with something. Um, any thoughts on that? Mm -hmm. Right, I mean, one of the things that, um, one of the things that I find particularly evil is, is um, the, you can get a subpoena which says that not only do you have to turn over your customer's data, but you're not allowed to tell your customer that you did so. Um, and so uh, a defense against that is to set up the system so that all accesses to the data are logged and that the customer can access the log and find out that some administrator within the cloud accessed the data and they may not know whether it was an administrator in the cloud or a state or a state actor that was demanding that they do so but at least they know that something suspicious is going on and and that's always a uh, uh, an interesting one there was a uh, uh, one of the things that I remember recommending that Microsoft do, and it looked like they were, it, it looked like they had started, was that um, you can get a uh, you can get a, a subpoena that says, you know, you have to turn over this data, and furthermore, you um, can't tell the customer that you you did this, and furthermore, you can't tell anyone that we've asked you to to turn over this data um, without being able to tell anyone. And, um, and I said, well, could we make an announcement that in fact that has never happened and that we're going to repeat that announcement every month until we stop for some reason? <laughs> Um, and they did make an announcement like that a couple of times, and then they stopped, but I don't know why they stopped. I, sus I It might be because they got such a subpoena, or more likely it's because 
they got got tired of doing it. You know, it's a it's a it's a hard thing to do. But you know, coming up with clever ways of of sending messages is a is a tricky business. Thank you very much. <laughs> Eh, gracias, Carlos. Eh, les recordamos eh, que pueden hacer sus preguntas también en idioma español y portugués, y eh, para lo cual Charlie tiene un traductor. Eh, adelante. Hola, soy Do I'm, I'm Douglas. Uh, uh, one of the challenges uh, on uh, cloud provider was uh, a few years ago the, the future in the traffic from west, south, south to north traffic was normal in a data center. But uh, last, east west traffic was a problem. It was solved by, by the intelligence of the V switches on the virtualization. But uh, with the latest uh, service as a container as a service uh, where the traffic doesn't come out from the virtual machine uh, it's a it's an issue it's a problem uh, how do you how do you think that this correct solution for that how how your, your proposal for that uh, to, to filter to analyze the traffic between uh, two containers inside a same VM uh, with no, no no possibility to look to that. Right, well, uh, yeah, I mean, one of the problems with, with uh, you know, firewalls were traditionally built uh, that, you know, as a, as a separate piece of hardware that sits on the network. Um, and the problem is that the network has been moving further and further that, you know, first, first with virtual machines and, the, and, and you could have two VMs on the same server that are doing things. And there it's, it's unnatural to route it, you know, externally through a piece of hardware and with containers in inside a single operating system even more so. Um, and I think that, you know, uh, the world needs to acknowledge that and there are, you know, a couple approaches. One is to, uh, is to, you know, essentially prevent the east-west traffic, make it go the long route, the expensive route out and back in, um, where performance is not an important consideration. When important is an important consideration, you really need to move the firewall functionality down into, you know, at least the the uh, hypervisor and 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 for containers actually into the um, the operating system, probably as its own as its own container inside the uh, inside that same operating system. Yes. Muchas gracias. Adelante. Go ahead. Hola. Uh, sorry, guys, por favor. Uh, Michael Pettimore's Linux Magic out of Vancouver. Um, one of the things that we've been discussing here and that uh, at, in a lot of the other RIRs is talking about uh, valid data for who is and how to actually reach the operator of an IP address in case of an issue. They may have been hacked or something. Now, of course, when we're looking at somebody, you mentioned you were working with Azure and, make, and of course, made doing these design policy decisions. But when you have a large set of IPs out there where there is absolutely no visibility on how long that operator has been using that IP, who's operating it, etc. You must have had some uh, thoughts about the necessary, uh, the requirements around who is and SWIP when you designed this. Could you maybe reflect on the business decisions that I guess allowed them to sort of thumb their nose about uh, over the intent of uh, who is in SWIP. Um, well, I mean, it's a there's both there are both technical challenges and then and then political challenges. The um, uh, you know one of the technical challenges, for example, is that that as particularly as IPv4 addresses become more and more scarce. Um, that that even knowing even knowing an IPv4 address doesn't tell you who it is you're talking to because there are going to be multiple people natted behind the same address, um, and in some sense, a lot of the tools that want to do those reverse lookups need to be generalized to be able to do look reverse lookups not just on. Um, 
uh, not just on IP addresses, but also on the ports within them to be able to, to, to do that reverse lookup. Uh, it, it does seem to me that, that what cloud providers ought to do is, is if they have customers when they're renting out IP addresses, they ought to dynamically update the, the various databases so that somebody who looks up the IP address will find, find the customer who's there. Um, those tools might or, might or might not be responsive, you know, be able to be updated quickly enough. They were sort of designed where, for, for a case where people owned IP addresses for, for months or years, as opposed to now when people might own an IP address for minutes. Um, uh, but, but certainly, you know, we need to leverage the existing tools to the degree that we, that we can, and we need to build new tools to the extent that the, the old tools don't work. Um, yeah, I can't, I can't really, you know, defend the behavior of people that, that, you know, don't bother to set up the reverse lookups. Um, uh, essentially what, you know, Effectively, they're taking responsibility for the the owners of the of the things if they don't expose who the owners are, um, and uh, you know, and for relaying the messages. It's a difficult thing with respect to who's accountable for what. A lot of these rules are not really written down. They're uh, they're word of mouth and and they're what experiences go on. So. Um, uh, one thing that, that tends to happen is that people figure out that, oh, well, these guys are harboring lots of bad guys, so we'll just blacklist their whole set of IP addresses. Um, and, and sometimes that will get people's attention enough to start behaving in a responsible fashion. But um, yeah, I don't, get, there sort of aren't, aren't rules and everything's enforced by convention and there's a long learning curve for people. So. I'm interested to see how this how this set of rules evolves, but I don't I don't really know the state of it, and don't really know what the highest priority things to fix are. Eh, eh, adelante con una pregunta remota. Eh, creo que es la última pregunta y pasamos entonces al siguiente eh, orador. Adelante. Eh, bueno, tenemos un comentario de Marcone de Brasil. Él comenta eh, el internet tiene que ser neutro. Brasil. Ah, bueno. Eh, comenta que el Internet tiene que ser neutro, los datos de los usuarios deben ser protegidos, al igual que los registros. Su comentario. Um. I'm not sure, wait, wait a minute, I'm not sure I understand the question. Uh, the... It's not a question, it's a comment. Ah, okay. Bueno, muchísimas gracias. Thank you very much, Charlie. Okay. Eh, vamos a darle un fuerte aplauso a Charlie. Eh, seguimos eh, en la siguiente presentación. Eh, tenemos a Carlos Ortiz con Optam RPKI de la CNIC. Eh, adelante, Carlos. Eh, 